like, that's really, really epic. I love that. Right? News reporter. <laughs> <laughs> We're here at the Pharmacy for Max Academy. Thank you all for joining us. If you're watching us on YouTube uh, after the recording, uh, this is going to be an exciting episode. We're, we have Kanmai here, uh, pharmacist and software engineer, uh, joining us today. So we're going to be talking a little bit about how pharmacists can be a really powerful, uh, can play a really powerful role in software and in, in healthcare technology in general, but especially as software engineers. And so uh, I want to kind of give you the really high level of like how Khan Mai like really tra transitioned from a pharmacist all the way, taking you all the way back from pharmacy school and how, how you got here, right? Uh, so sure. let's maybe begin with like, wh where, where are you now? Like what, what's your kind of role and your uh you know, your sure. title and all of that good stuff. Sure. So I am formally trained as a full stack software engineer. So that includes both back end and front end. Um, but we're going to clarify back end and cl yeah. front end, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so back end is more of like a database type of role. So the languages would be SQL or Python or other languages like that. And then front end is more of the, um, like design the layout, what you'll see when you open up a web page. So um, that's a lot of JavaScript, a lot of HTML, CSS. Um, both require a lot of logic, but um, yeah, usually it's uh, back end tends to be a little bit more complicated. But um, at my current role, I am a front end software engineer. Um, and yeah, I love it. I've been here for about a year. Congrats. I mean, a year you. in, in startup land or in, in health uh -huh. tech in general, it's, it's a long time, right? Yeah, it is. I've survived. I've <laughs> survived. And the imposter syndrome is real. It's, it's right. exactly what they say it is. Right. But um, yeah, I feel like it's like dog years. You know, I feel like I've lasted a very long time. Well, that's impressive. And it really, you know, thanks for joining us today. So like, I, you know, you started off actually not kind of going that this route. Right, you're in 2018. Right. You graduated <clears throat> pharmacy school, but um, maybe you could kind of take us all the way back when you were a student and sure. kind of give, give us a snapshot of like what you were thinking when you're uh, yeah. in your last year and what were you kind of what were you th what's your thought process like? Yeah, yeah. So I um, I actually originally was <clears throat> going into archaeology, so that was mm. my um, shtick until like 2011 and um, I randomly applied for pharmacy school um, because of a special program at Creighton where you just have to do like a two, four program and then you graduate with a bachelor's and a doctorate. So mm. I applied not thinking much of it, but I ended up getting accepted. And of course um, that was a lot more of a solid role than archeology span would be, unfortunately. Yeah. So I went into that and I initially had a lot of issues. I, sh I was supposed to graduate in 2015 and I just kept failing back to back failing. And I just couldn't really figure out why. And it, it, mainly it's because I really didn't have a passion for the things, the roles that pharmacists have traditionally. And I mean, the, the logic was there. The information is there. Like I'm great at studying, whatever. I've always been great at school, but if you don't have a passion for something, you don't really have a desire to retain that knowledge or even mm. care to do these things, you know? So I just was not doing well. And, um, it was very like debilitating mentally, physically, um, financially, cause it was very expensive tuition. So like all of these things really right. added up together. And um, so I, I stayed, I fought my way through it and I survived somehow. But my last year of pharmacy school, I um, did an academic rotation and one of my projects or um, objectives was to write a research paper on um, like the different curriculums of different pharmacy schools and how they mm. differ and where Creighton, my university differs. Yeah. And so what I noticed is that the school I went to was very, very much clinically focused, 
traditional roles, even rotations that I wanted to go on that were non-traditional weren't available. Even though it was listed on the list, it was just like, uh, I would recommend doing ambulatory because, you know, you'll get better get a better job there. Don't do um, uh, like, you know, uh, what industrial or whatever, like all that stuff. So I, I just already kind of had a bad feeling about it. Um, so I ended up writing the paper and noticing that all these other um, highly accredited pharmacy schools had more technology electives and um, more opportunities like precision medicine and um, informatics, etc. Whereas my school didn't offer those programs like at all, no electives at all. And um, wow. that, yeah, and that frustrated me as someone that I, I've i always enjoyed technology. Growing up, I've mm -hmm. always had a, a fondness for it. So um, I didn't even know it was possible to combine the two, pharmacy and technology. I wasn't even aware that it was a field. And so I wrote my paper on... Um, technology and how important it is for pharmacists to learn how to interface with these things. Because as a pharmacist, we deal with technology all day, um, whether it's with EMRs, uh, pharmacy filling systems, robots, like automation, not a lot of, not a lot of uh, other fields have to deal with that, you know? So we have to troubleshoot mm -hmm. every yeah. bit of technology that we have. We're also using a lot of old technology Um so it just goes to show how difficult it is for healthcare to adapt and change to technology. And my, the biggest part of the paper was that if healthcare cannot keep up with how quickly technology advances, then healthcare is going to plummet even more than, you know, we already ha are having trouble. So like even more so, not to be neurotic or anything, but um, it, that's just the truth because we are moving so quickly. And the benefits of technology, there's just so much there. Um, not to mention yeah. all the issues with medication errors and such and all that stuff. So yeah, getting out of that but, is, that's how I got started with it. So, so this is really the catalyst for you forming like another kind of, or rethinking almost like your, yeah. your next step. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's funny you say that because like, you know, uh, in, in my like last year or last few years of school, you know, I, I, I had the same sort of thought and I was like, you know, we've, as a professional obligation, we need to be more thoughtful on how do we kind of learn technology? How do we kind of mm -hmm. integrate technology into our practice? And how do we kind of like partner with, uh, you know, technology vendors or, or mm -hmm. you know, technologists mm -hmm. out there to make healthcare better? And so I think what you kind of did was similar to what I was thinking, you know, in 2010 in a different, uh, if, in a different sort of uh, space at the time, you know, EHRs were starting to form, you know, and, and mm, merger yeah. acquisitions of hospitals and health systems. And so it's interesting that you're kind of seeing those intersections while you're a student and that sort of really catalyzed you and your career, your next steps. So yeah, I, yeah, I think, I, I think this is, this is great. I think the other thing that I just wanted to mention was, uh, you, you know, you mentioned awareness and, and, you know, this is the dichotomy we, we, we're a lot of the folks, you know, the pharmacy students hopefully are watching right now are also kind of, um, seeing in their institutions, you know, there's these traditional areas of focus and, you know, mm -hmm. rightly so, you know, the, the, the folks within these organizations, uh, the faculty, you know, they're, they're very familiar with these sort of pathways because they've already gone through it, right? Mm -hmm. But there's not many that organizations that have folks that come from health tech that are yeah. teaching or in teaching roles uh, that can share their also their experience. And so, you know, it makes sense that maybe that information is not there, but awareness is needed. And mm. I think, frankly, you know, even more so now. So maybe you could kind of walk us through and it's funny because i actually you know we were before this we were talking about like i follow you on twitter i follow you on linkedin yeah you know, there's a lot of great awareness and advocacy to be honest that you're you're posting for our community and so yeah you know, uh, it, it's just a great thing to have these platforms to kind of reach reach students and reach other peers um so maybe you could kind of as we talk about this you could kind of yeah. walk us through the next steps of your journey you know 
um, after graduation, perhaps, you know, what kind of, sure. what kind of steps did you take towards that new kind of thought? And okay. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So that's a great question. So, um, initially I leveraged social media and technology to discover more about the open roles or the, um, positions that I maybe be qualified for. Mm. Later, um, I started using social media as a means to get more of the word out. But um, initially, we what I've noticed from the clients that I talk to and also my own mindset when I began is that we believe that we have a great set of technological skills but we don't know how that translates to what role. Like, for instance, I know I have all these technical skills, but how do I even search for a job if I don't even know what the role is called? So um, one of the things that was very difficult was that um, a lot of these roles are very new, so they're very undefined. So they're Mm, very hard to, yeah, they're very hard to look for and they're hard to search for. The good Mm -hmm. thing about undefined roles is that you can squeeze your way through if you do it right. Like, it's not like, oh, you need a degree in pharmacy informatics, you know? It's more of like, you need some, like, technical experience here. So Mm -hmm. it's easy to weasel your way in and get your foot through the door if um, you recognize these undefined roles. The difficulty is finding them. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah. What I... What I did was um, I discovered that pharmacy informaticist was a role, and it has been for a few years. I don't know where it's been. I just didn't know about it. So, um, <laughs> right. yeah, I, I, I it actually started with um, around COVID time because I was working as a clinical ho- um, hospital pharmacist for a while, and COVID hit, and I was like, I would love to work at home. So I did a lot of searching. And one of the things that I dedicated a lot of my time to ever since, or even a year before my rotations was job searching. Mm. It was something that I spent a lot of time doing. Um, Up to this date, I think I've applied to over 2000 jobs. And it's say 2000 jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Like ever since 2017. Yeah. That, that's still quite a bit of job it's searching. A lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And the point is that, like, that's how yeah. desperate you are to get in. Like, you, the, uh, like the traditional roles, they are very important. And I, I definitely value retail and hospital pharmacists and ambulatory and whatnot. Right. It's, it's right. very critical to have them. But as um, someone who doesn't really have a passion for it it's very very difficult to um live like that so mm. i um so, so just to kind of clarify this like yeah. like you know you worked at this hospital uh, you had hospital experience hospital pharmacy experience yeah. and that's sort of like lays a foundation for s- yes. some of the clinical operational skills so i, I you know i agree Absolutely. with you there like i i had the similar experience um but kind of taking you taking the audience back here to 2000 jobs like that like i just want to emphasize 2000 jobs is kind of sweat equity that you put in you put in time and effort yeah. to doing this and not specifically uh so of course you're targeting jobs but also uh and maybe specific jobs but also perhaps this lends itself to your also on this process of discovery is this kind of where this mm, so on this sort of undefined jobs kind of come into your perspective True. are you finding yeah. these jobs through that process or what right that goes back to yeah exactly what i was saying before about how i had these technical skills i just didn't know where that would land me so ah, um I, I just kept like throwing darts at the table or you know um, yeah. at the whatever and mm-hmm. seeing which one would hit mm-hmm. um and that that's when I eventually I found the informaticist role that I didn't even know existed. And that was specifically because I was looking for a remote role around the COVID season. And um, yeah, Which I applied for sense. the job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had no formal that's... technical experience. So they were really right. um, taking a risk by hiring me. And 
what, what I like to say, yeah, what I like to say is getting into technology is a lot of luck, networking, and formal technical experience, which the third is where we as pharmacists will lack. And it's hard to gain that because we can't just stop being a pharmacist and go do a technical job and then apply, you know, like that's just not feasible. The cart before the horse so, kind of scenario. Yeah. 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 So what I uh, utilized was my experience as a clinical hospital pharmacist. Mm. And I mean, it's really all about technical language. When it comes to technical jobs, they want to hear you talk like a technical person. So the language is a lot different than healthcare language. So the way yeah. that goes is when they were like, so um, what experience do you have with software? Um, what do you know about EHRs? Um, like, how did you like work with them, blah, blah, blah. So I would utilize uh, my experiences as being like, I would troubleshoot the filling system um, by, you know, uh, making uh -huh. the adjudication process a lot more fluid. I would improve the workflow by doing this and that. And like these little technical words shows to them that I know what I'm talking about. There yeah. in lies the difference between a pharmacist and like a technical role. And I would um, talk about finding solutions because technical roles are all about finding solutions, um, noticing the gaps, and then uh, throwing out a solution that you think would be best to fill that right. gap. So, um, so I would systems talk about how, level, mm -hmm. systems level thinking, and you know processes, and you yeah. you're, you're speaking the the they're talking the talk, I guess, uh, mm, with what they're yeah. familiar. So having familiarity with with that, like hundred percent exactly. Agree. Crucial. So I love that you did that. So exactly. Yeah, that's how it works. And like, just you would you would think that it's not that impressive, but you'll be mm -hmm. like, you know, I uh, customize the interface by adding a uh, custom renal calculator or something, and they were like, oh my god, she knows what interface is. You know, it's like that's like a chip, that's like a typical word. But the thing is that a lot of healthcare professionals don't expect other healthcare professionals to know these technical words. And what I hear a lot from my clients is they'll be like talking or getting an interview from a company or a startup and they, they will be like, oh my gosh, you know so much um, about technology for a pharmacist, you know? And it's like, well, yeah, I work with this stuff every day. It's just, we have a different title, that's all. Um, mm. Had we been in the technical field, our role would probably be called like technical support or something, data analyst, or, you know, right, uh, right. data operator, entry, whatever. Um, it, just, it just so happens that our title is just pharmacist. So when they see that on a resume, um, they just think you don't have any technical skills. I, you know, it's funny you said, like, I, I get that a lot when I have to, you know, ask, people ask, you know, like, just, just people when I meet them uh, with social occasions or what have yeah. you. And I'm like, I start off with, like, I say I'm a pharmacist, right? And yeah. it's funny because, like, then you have to shift their mind into sort of another uh, space because you have to kind of like guide them through like, oh, this is yeah. this is what I actually do, right? And not not the clinical, the operational kind of part of pharmacy. Yeah. So that's interesting you say that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it really shocks so, them. <laughs> well, I think it's a good good way to shock people, I guess. Uh, it's a good conversation yeah. starter. To, but, uh, it yeah, is. I, I wanted to, so, so once you started the informatics position, um, you know, it – you're you're still learning you're still kind of mm, developing yeah. and so um maybe you could walk us through like that what that kind of journey looked like and then you know kind of sure. how you pivoted from that even sure so that that learning curve was very steep um i didn't really? know yeah i didn't know anything about sql database mm. database architecture um, I was working mm. for Nebraska's PDMP and I loved that job. It was a lot of fun. Um, and the issue was, was that it was, it was only about like four pharmacists, um, managing the whole state's PDMP. So it was That's pretty shocking. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, among a bunch of like nurses right. and like other professionals, but right. like when it comes to, um, HIEs and PDMPs, you would think there mm -hmm. would be a lot more of us. But um, anyways, 
Um, oh, by the way, yeah. folks who, who are watching PDMP, yeah. uh, prescription drug monitoring program, right? For the yeah, state. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, and HIE health information exchange. Yes. I think. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. No. And, you know, each state has their own PDMP. Uh, yes. I think the, the over, overall kind of uh, use case for these organizations is to uh, monitor for prescription practices, mm. right? For providers and, and especially like looking at opioid use. Yeah. And uh, substance for abuse. Being yeah. Opioid use and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Very interesting stuff, uh, especially yeah. from the telehealth perspective as well. So, oh, uh, yeah. It was very fulfilling. I really enjoyed yeah. that job. Yeah. It just, um, there's just something about, uh, I, I guess it was just the difference between being a hospital pharmacist and just being like, you know, yelled yeah. at all the time to going to like feeling like you're doing something good for the community, which I mean, both are good for the community, but um, just less yelling on this other end. So um, yeah, I, uh, we were just uh, taking on projects that would mean like integrating the PDMP into local hospitals or rural hospitals. Mm -hmm. So connecting and meeting with um, other informaticists and um, making sure that they were connecting with our API and being able to data exchange and making sure that that was a clear and open system and that it was working. Mm. Um, okay. Another project, yeah, another project that we did was so um, for the PDMP, pharmacists need to submit their uh, reports for their dispenses. So mm -hmm. we would um, integrate with pharmacy filling software so that it would automatically send just to make things easier. Um, so that was that, I thought that was just really cool because these are things that you don't really think about. And I learned a lot about um, how network works how the internet works, how integration works, and um, how data works. And it's it's a very, very important topic and subject if you want to get into anything technical. Yeah, 100% agree. I, uh, just thinking about this meme uh, on someone describing the internet to someone else, and it's like this black box. Definitely, yeah. you definitely like uncovered the black box and you actually figure out like what the architecture looks like. And I think that's really important. You know, I think yeah. from a systems level perspective, you have to know a lot of that um, knowledge yeah, if you're absolutely. going technical, right? I, I think that's really important. But, you know, uh, you kind of, you kind of really kind of set this, the picture for your next phase. So like after or, or during this phase, what were you thinking and how did you kind of like, think about sort of the next stage of your career. So sure. as a software engineer, like, cause I'm, that's kind of where I'm really kind of curious. How, yeah, like how the heck really did that happen? It, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like um, it's like, it's not like you just pick up a manual and you like get started, right? Like there has to be a yeah. lot of different baby steps along the way. Yeah. So it, it start, it started with um, the project that was integrating the PMP into EMRs. And so uh -huh. Um, we were utilizing a software that was, I think, government-based. And um, it's not a stereotype. Government software takes a long time to fix. You submit a ticket and it takes forever. And then, you know, months later, there's a solution. Oh, great, you know. But <sighs> as someone who is – I'm very impatient. And I love to have a solution right away. If I don't – it brings me great anxiety. So I would submit these tickets and, you know, I would relay to my colleagues like, man, this is just, if I, if I was a software engineer, man, I would just click that, sorry, click that stuff out. And, and um, another thing that I was thinking a lot was that had there been a pharmacist on the engineering team, mm -hmm. those issues wouldn't have arisen Anyhow, there was something about um, the reports on our PDMP uh, uploading as like refills or we, we wanted the it was like a Excel kind of like uh, table. So it would have the patient name, you know, pharmacy refills left, blah, blah, blah. But the refills left kept coming up as a title that would say unit dose or something. And we were like, why is that happening? Oh. And so, yeah. And so one of my colleagues was like, oh, that's because 
in inpatient, they don't call refills refills. They call them units or something, or I don't know. I wasn't an inpatient pharmacist, but anyways, so that's what the title was coming. And, um, in my head, I was like, if there was a pharmacist on board, a retail pharmacist, anyone that has filled outside of inpatient, that wouldn't have been something that even rendered in the first place. And another right. it's very thing, contextual. Yeah. 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 It's something that only an experienced pharmacist would really know. And no software engineer would know that. And they end up hiring yep. um, like, nurses or someone else in the hospital to be mm. the medical expert or clinical mm. decision maker for these interfaces. Mm. And in reality, you don't need those two roles. Just combine the two, a pharmacist, software engineer. So. Oh, wow. That that's, nice. that's critical. Yeah. yeah. So you were like, oh, let's combine the two roles. Yeah. Here now. Yeah. Like, do don't <laughs> hire. Exactly. Don't hire a software engineer and then spend more money on a clinical decision support, whatever. I don't know what the role is called, but sorry, my dogs are going ham. Um, oh, I, I, I see that. That's awesome. They're, they're, <laughs> they're excited as us. You know, we're, we're hearing yeah. about this firsthand. Sure. It's like you're, you're like trying to solve this problem and you're like combining seeing these two things occur yeah. simultaneously. And you're like, how do I tackle this as, mm, yeah, as like one sort of entity? How do you, how do you like solve this problem? Right. Uh, with so both like, sides of the, yeah. I, I was like, I need to do that. So one, uh, mm -hmm. I had another colleague that was in the like learning and development part department and, um, she would connect with the community about the HIE and, um, you know, healthcare data and the importance of, um, social determinants of health and stuff like that. So she would also get notifications about scholarships. So she sent me one that she found about healthcare professionals or students that want to get into technology. And mm -hmm. so I randomly applied, not thinking much of it. And I ended up getting the scholarship. And so that prompted me to quit my job. Wow. And I, um, well, I went and applied to the uh, Seoul National University in Korea for a master's degree in computer science. Mm. Now, the reason for that is because uh, when you're surrounded by um, academics, they will tell you that you cannot get a software engineering job without a specific degree. Um, and I wasn't really, I've heard of boot camps, but I didn't know anyone that had attended them. I didn't know anyone right. that, you know, attended it and then gotten one. I didn't really know right. much about it. And it mm -hmm. sounded risky and I didn't do my due diligence. I should have. But anyway, so I am embarking on this master's degree. It gets, um, it gets uh, delayed because it's 2021 and COVID is getting worse. Uh. So I am at home thinking I really don't want to wait. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I'm impatient. That goes back to that. And um, I, at the same time, one of my friends on LinkedIn posted that she had just graduated from Hackbright Academy and she just got a job like a month out of it. And I was like, what? What is this? I had heard Shocking. of boot camps. Yeah, I had heard of boot camps, <laughs> but I had never actually been extremely cognizant of it and thought about it. Right. So I dove into that, Googled, you know, read a about it, asked her about it, and um, I applied the next day. So wow, that's how that started. And in order to get in, you have to do like a um, technical exam, entrance exam. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pretty basic, but it is something you have to study for. And I had been learning, I had been self-learning Python since pharmacy school. So for a while, but I only did it like for fun. It wasn't anything that was serious. But that enabled me to kick back up um, to start studying for this entrance exam. And so that program was a full-time four-month course. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I met the company I work for now at the Demo Night, Revenue Cat. And I got the job like even like a week after I graduated, which is unheard of. That's amazing. So, and, and four months, by the way, also for boot camp is very short it's very as well, good. right? It's very, it's short, very good. It's very good. Yeah. So, yeah, because most are very long. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've heard of like a year, you know, for some, like I think yes, Iron Yard absolutely. used to be 
uh, when Iron Yard existed, I think well, they used to be quite long as well. But there's mm-hmm. a few others, um, you know, out there. Uh, I'm sure out there now. Maybe maybe that's kind of a, a good thing to have as like a list or database or something to, yeah. for folks that are watching to kind of review. But um, I just wanted to mention, like you you did all of this. Yeah, you know, there's two things I think that stand out here. Like one, you had did you have some mentors? I think that's one question I had. Like, did you have mentors throughout the whole process, or it mm-hmm. sounds like you, you some some of the process you didn't actually have mentors. You did a lot of self learning and, and self mm-hmm. kind of discovery. But yeah, what are your thoughts for for that piece? Um, mentors in the boot camp. Uh, well, mentors in general, I guess. Like you know, uh, uh, okay. prior to you even thinking about the master's program, did you have a mentor mm. that sort of guided oh, you or I did see. you bounce I see. You know, feedback off of or sure. yeah, or um, throughout the journey? So in truth, I didn't have a mentor. The only mentor I had was my intuition. And that's that's all I had. And she's great. She's very smart. So I went I like with that. that. I mean, and yeah, that's, that's, all there is. that's, that's really impressive. That's very brave as well. Cause you know, I think it says, says a lot about like, you know, uh, how you operate, but you know, there's mm. folks out there that you know, it, you know, do need a mentor or do need some sort of guide yeah. through the process. And you know, in all honesty, I wish I did have a guide for my journey as well. You know, avoid Same. some of the pitfalls and the pain, right? Yeah. Um, but I think I think also just leaning on your community, like you know, you're really involved on LinkedIn and yeah. you know, again, like other platforms. So so am I. And so it's it's nice to have that community that you can reach out to. And so don't don't think you can't like do anything. It's just sort of having hundred percent, mm-hmm. you know, having the right folks to surround yourself with, I think is some sort of, I would say consider mentorship as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, the, the other point I did want to make was, you know, that, that you, you took this on without the perspective of like, okay, you've put in this much time. Into, so I've had, you know, I had a, pharmacy uh class old pharmacy classmate reached out to me he's working at uh retail pharmacy right now and he said you know he's kind of fed up of it i think you know i think it's just gone a little bit too crazy and you know i just uh you know i shared with him a few things you know that he can maybe take up you know data analyst kind of roles and some other Uh, uh, camps around that um but really it's it's the point of like how do you shift from thinking okay you've put in so much time and effort into a four-year or six-year like whatever you know program with a pharmd right especially or a residency on top of that and also the experience you built up at the hospital the retail Mm. you know how do you like go of a lot of that to then Mm, shift yeah kind of thought process of like let's let's get at this let's get this new kind of career it may be a bit of a struggle up front but over the long mm. term, it actually may be a better ROI. So how do you get over that right. um, That kind of mindset? Mm, okay, so that um, it's very difficult because you work so hard for your doctorate degree and then you right. are you climb that ladder and you're a drug expert. You're at the top, you know, once you graduate. Um, and so when I went from clinical pharmacist to like pharmacy informaticist, I had to take a pay cut. It was a big pay cut, but I knew that that experience would be valuable and that that opportunity would not come back. It is very rare to get a job without technical experience. And I'm like so grateful for them. And um, I do want to reiterate that I, I didn't have a mentor, but I did have a lot of support um, from two hmm. pharmacists, Laura and Brandy, at the PDMP um, on getting me to go, like, go do your thing, you know? Yeah. And so that helps out a lot. But so um, circling back, I uh, I do definitely want to go back to healthcare. It's not something that I completely drove away from, Um I, my goal at the company I'm working for now is to um, learn all the basics and learn how a startup works and learn as much as I can because the opportunity of getting an entry-level software engineer job is very, very hard 
and um, they've given me that opportunity. Mm. So I'm trying to make the most of it. But the difficult part is being a drug expert, being top tier, and then dropping all the way back down to the bottom again. And you're at the bottom for a very long time. And it is a perpetual learning curve. And it is exhausting. And technically, um, I got hired August 2021. It's 2022 now. Technically, I'm like still training. I'm still like a junior. It's still Mm -hmm. very, very hard. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition to the work that I have to put in every day, I am also doing extra training because I didn't have that like foundational computer science degree. There are a lot of stuff that I don't know Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and that the boot camp just can't teach you because it's just not enough time. So, yeah, and that's, that's a really good point. It's really, you know, you're speaking about us being lifelong learners essentially. And you really, you know, if if you're a pharmacist, I would probably expect you're still going to be a lifelong learner. You have to, st- there's new drugs coming out of the market. There's new uh, therapies, new protocols, new evidence-based, you know, literature coming out. So, you know, yeah. hopefully if you're a really good pharmacist, you still probably need to keep up to date with all of that. So lifelong learning doesn't go away just because we get That's into so practice, true. right? Um, it's just, this is a different mode, I guess, of of learning. And, you know, there there is things that you, like like you said, you still have to kind of, look at foundational level you know concepts still because you didn't go through that process but it's still a process of learning so mm-hmm. i i really resonate with that you know i think this yeah. is kind of where you know speaking with other uh pharmacists who have um you know gone a more non-traditional pathway i think this is something they still have to kind of run up against um but you also i think the important point that you made was you don't have to lose a lot of your learning either. You're yes. still uh, uh, sought after a value um, in terms of being a healthcare expert or a mm-hmm. pharmacy expert. Uh, and let's say, you know, in a few years time or next year, even, uh, you know, you, you start as a software engineer with a healthcare company or healthcare focused company. Absolutely. Uh, incredible value, right? You still have yeah. that context. That's you're bringing the goal. Mm-hmm. So that's the goal, right? Yeah. So that's that, the ultimate goal for me. Yeah. So I really enjoyed learning about your process on and your journey, to be honest. I, I think this is really inspiring for a lot of folks watching, um, whether whatever stage of the career they're at. So whether you're a student just starting yeah. out or whether you're maybe a mid-level practitioner or, or career pra- practitioner, and it's very relevant. Um, so for the folks who are listening, Maybe you could give us a snapshot of like, you know, what your, ind- so you mentioned like, it's really, really hard to get into a software engineer, entry level software engineer role right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, competition's fierce, I think across it the is. board, right? Uh, whether you're going to like product role, marketing, you know, anywhere in health tech, health tech, I think there's a lot of fierce competition, but especially so in your case. So maybe you could kind of give us a snapshot about that. And then also just, you know, give us a bit more of the industry trends, like what's going on mm. in the industry in terms of this, um, where are the roles that are emerging? Like what, what do they look like? And yeah. maybe just give us a bit of, uh, yeah, a bit of your insights from the field. Sure. So what I like to tell um, my clients is that the best way to enter into tech with the lowest barrier to entry, I believe, um, and this is assuming that you don't want to spend more time learning to code. You don't want to go to boot camp. You don't want to go to mm-hmm. a data science camp. Mm-hmm. You just want to go from pharmacist to technology. Mm-hmm. The lowest barrier to entry is either picking up a technical support role for like a healthcare Ooh, or that's a good one. Yeah. Um, pharmacy, like mm-hmm. virtual pharmacy or like a healthcare startup mm-hmm. or look into product or project management. Now there's a difference between the two, depending Mm -hmm. on the company, you know, are they um, selling a product Then they need product managers. But if, uh, but in regards to project managers, all industries have a project manager. Um, What I, I like to say is that the best product managers are the ones that have extensive domain expertise and they understand the customer and the user very well. That's why technical support roles, pay cut, 
they end up being um, promoted to product manager roles because in a technical support role, you learn about everything. You learn about the product, you learn about the customer, and then you become the professional in that manner or the expert in that manner. Ah, that's a good way to think about this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So then my other take is that if you Mm -hmm. work with like an EHR Mm -hmm. or something, just for example, like if you work with Epic a lot and um, you see a product manager role open, uh, apply for it because you are an expert in that domain. You use it every day and you know the customer well because you are the customer. So I like to say that product manager roles are the best way to get in. I like that. And, you know, uh, just to add to that, I think uh, looking, if you're looking for a a little bit more of a non-technical role, you know, product managers are also Mm -hmm. a great way to kind of think about it because you you do interface with a dev team and you do interface with other teams cross-functionally, but you're not necessarily in the weeds with the actual software and the code, right? Exactly. You get to, um, you know, communicate with all sorts of teams. So then that helps open up your mind to the possibility of internally transferring into one of those teams. So it it really opens up the doors. And the great thing about healthcare technology is that it's advancing so quickly that there's so many different um, fields for different kinds of pharmacists. So if you're like an, an MTM pharmacist, there are MTM startups out there for you. If you're like a, like, you know, durable medical equipment pharmacist or something, there are startups that focus on DMEs. So it's like, you just need to find your sector. That That's actually a really great uh, point as well. Like folks who have the experience in the hospital yeah. or community or whatever setting, uh, you know, they can apply those skills in a different way for these startups or these healthcare tech companies. And I really, I really appreciate the fact that you mentioned it because that's something that we yeah. really don't often talk about, but we do see in the industry. So yeah. really great point. Um, and so like, you know, you, you just wanted to wrap this up by saying, you know, you're, you mentioned consulting. So, um, I would love to have you share a bit more about uh, how you got started with consulting and then also what what you're offering in terms of uh, consulting sure. and where folks can kind of find you. So that that's kind of, yeah, let's sure. hit all those points there. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. That sounds great for me. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, like I was mentioning, going back to the 2000 jobs that I applied for. So I... Um, I set up a lot of different job alerts for uh, numerous different companies and I was still getting them years later. So um, Mm. fast forward or rewind like three months ago, this is all very new. Um, A few months ago, I got a job alert for like a product manager for Google health. And I was like, that sounds amazing. So I posted it on LinkedIn and it went viral and I didn't really know what to make of it because I've, It was just such a random act for me. So I had many pharmacists reach out asking, you know, how do I go about doing this? What do I need? What do I do? I really want this role. And so I, um, I ended up having to monetize that because I didn't have enough time in the day to talk to all these people. I was still uh, working as an entry level software engineer with no time already. So I would utilize my weekends to um, talk to these people and help them and uh, teach them about the technical language, uh, what experiences they have that can be translated to a technical resume, which is Mm -hmm. um, very important, important for technical roles, because the difference is that as academics, we like to submit our CV and the longer it is, the better technical resumes the shorter, the better. They just want to know that you're an expert at the tech stack that they have. That's all they care about. So I help them translate their CV into a technical resume. And um, for anyone watching, I think what would really help is that you don't need me to make you a technical resume. You just need to, um, from here on out, write down every piece of technology that you touch and interface with just write down the Mm. name write down what you know um what you did on there what gaps that you notice what you liked what you didn't like what you would do to improve it and that Mm. will go a long way when you want to make a technical resume um but yeah so now i talk to 
um, these people and I just uh, help them throughout their journey. I in turn mentor them, which is what um, I was missing. And had I had a mentor, it wouldn't yeah. have taken me years to get to where I am. So I'm helping them get in as quickly as they can. And, and maybe avoid some of the pitfalls as well through, through oh, the yeah. process. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of pitfalls and trying to get a callback is the ultimate goal. And so That's amazing. we've gotten a few already, which is really amazing because I honestly yeah. didn't even think I could help people. Um, wow. So, so you're seeing the outcomes of your of your work with mm, folks yeah. really achieve those milestones. And so yeah. that's amazing. It, yeah. So isn't mm -hmm. it crazy? Like they have the experience. You just need to translate it on paper differently and you just need to talk differently. That's it. So yeah, I you know I hundred percent agree. I think it's the way you package your yourself mm -hmm. and your and how you like build your career and toolkits around you to 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 take you to the next step is really important. So um how can folks find you if if they're looking for help? Uh or sure. if they they want to even just chat, like what's what's kind of the next step? How do they get in touch? Um uh, sure. So I um I'm on LinkedIn. Khan Mai, K H A N H M A I. I'm also on Twitter, which is um dr underscore condors k-h-a-n-d-e-r-z and i also i guess i also have a calendly but i don't know if that's even gonna you can't qr code that can you well, <laughs> we may be able to but we'll definitely throw in the show notes so we'll yeah to... oh yeah yeah i can just send you the link yeah but sure. um yeah so just like you can schedule like a short time with me and we can just talk about what we can do and what the best roles are for you Amazing. Amazing. Really, I mean, I think it says a lot about what you've accomplished, but also what how you're willing to give back and like contribute to the community. So I really appreciate you, Cobb, yeah. for like taking the time for, to chat with us. I think this is really the premise of you know Pharmacy Informatics Academy. We're we're planning to have folks that we're gonna talk about product. We're gonna planning on having uh, folks talk yeah. about uh, data analyst roles and all these roles, but like what you've kind of shared with us is really important because it's like, how do you kind of rethink some of the old yeah. processes we've kind of inherited from our education, from other, you know, from our, you know, traditional setting? How do we rethink our roles? And then how do we like be brave to kind of try something mm, else, yeah. discover other journeys? So I think what you've highlighted is really important for people watching, students and practitioners and fellow pharmacists, you know, alike to kind of think about. Um, I encourage everyone to check out Khan Mai's LinkedIn. Please follow her and like, let's kind of stay uh, connected. Is there anything sure. else oh, yeah. you kind of wanted to um, uh, talk about as far as the future of health tech in general? Mm. Um, and do you want to like maybe drop something in here that sort of gives someone inspiration of like, you know, What's, what's the next thing they should be thinking about? What's coming around yeah. the corner? Sure. So the first thing that comes to mind is that if there are any doubts that you can't keep up with the pace of technology, that's all um, a lie. Because as pharmacists, mm. drug development, that information um, updates so quickly. You know, we need to learn how to navigate the documentation. We need to understand... Um, when these updates occur, we need to know where to look, et cetera. And they're updating by the hour. Technology is the exact same way. Mm -hmm. My job is a lot like my job as a pharmacist. So when I would get a drug, I, you know, I would uh, look up Lexicomp and go straight. I knew where to go and look up for that information. With the languages that I learn, for instance, React is something that I um, use every day. That documentation mm -hmm. um, is extremely valuable. And as you know, software version updates are constantly going, you know, mm -hmm. so they move just as quickly as drug development does. So by utilizing that skill, I know how to navigate that documentation quickly and I can find the solution right away. So if you already don't think that you have the skill, you already do. That's that's the thing. We we are um, we are trained to do these things and that's that's all it is. This is the documentation. That's the answer right there. 